Good afternoon. Thank you for coming today. I'd like to introduce Sheriff Casey Salisbury, Mason County Sheriff's Office. Thank you for joining us today. First and foremost in this issue, I want you to remember, please, this is a tragedy for an entire family. During the last number of days, I've been asked numerous times, what is it we can do? I would ask that you just remember the family and your thoughts and the surviving young woman, young girl who was involved in this. Please keep them in your thoughts and your prayers. Next, I'd like to thank the law enforcement community. Many of us were together at a meeting that morning when this incident occurred. The offers of assistance from the other agencies was overwhelming. I'd like to thank each one of the um, each one of those agencies, as well as the other first responders that went to the scene. This was a multi-agency response. Please also keep those members of those organizations and agencies that were on the front lines in your thoughts as we move through this program today. I greatly appreciate the concern and the contacts by people in our government partners. I recognize Senator Tim Sheldon, who is also one of our county commissioners, taking the time to stay in contact with us to see if there was any needs or anything that he could do. I also received several phone calls from Lieutenant, Brad, Lieutenant Governor Brad Owen, along with, I just spoke with again today, Governor Jay Inslee, and over the weekend, numerous times, to Congressman Derek Kilmer. Once again, as we proceed today, please keep the surviving victim and family in your thoughts and prayers. At this time, I will turn the remainder of the time over to my public information officer, Chief Ryan Sperling, and Under Sheriff Jim Barrett. They will be going over the, where we're at on this situation at this time. They'll be answering the further questions. Thank you. To start off with, I want you to understand this is not CSI. We are four days into a very long investigation. And if you took the weekend out, we're about two and a half days into this long investigation because some entities aren't uh, opening open during the weekend. So just keep that in mind as we go through. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go over our timeline that we gave during the press release. And then I'm going to go over all of the new things that we've learned since we put that press, re press release out. At 826 on Friday, the Mesa County Sheriff's Office, one of our supervisors received a phone call from a subject saying that he had done something bad and that he was suicidal. The supervisor at that point assigned an officer, two officers, to go up to the residence, but then he realized, I probably ought to get this guy back on the phone and stay in touch with him. So he called him back and stayed in touch with him while he drove up to the residence. When the deputies arrived at the residence, this supervisor was in contact with the suspect and said he had had a gun to his head. Once the deputies made contact with the residents, a 12-year-old female came out of the front door and ran towards deputies. She ran to the side that was beyond that residence on that one-way driveway. It was just one driveway going in and out, and she ran beyond the residence. So now we had a deputy with her, and they were effectively trapped because in order to go back in front of the residence, there was a window there, and he had a handgun, and we knew that he could shoot at the deputy or the 12 year old female so they were trapped on that side. <clears throat> Deputies continued discussion with the suspect while a multi-agency response of law enforcement be began. A limited number of Mason County Sheriff's deputies that were on scene established a perimeter along with Fish and Wildlife and the other people that were in the area that responded to help us. They set up containment around the residence because many times if we have an incident like this, the individual will try to leave the residence and may even try to go and get <coughs> hostages elsewhere. So we set up containment around the residence as well and continued to be in communication with them. They still worked on trying to get this individual to surrender peacefully. While discussions continued, the officers learned from the individual that there were deceased people in the chicken coop. At that point, one of the officers who had set up containment on the chicken coop looked inside and did confirm that there were bodies in there. 
A Mason County surplus military vehicle, it's called an MRAP, a mine resistant armor protected vehicle, was used to drive past the residence, get to the officer that was waiting with the injured or not the, the female that came out of the residence and that were able to ex extricate her to medical that was waiting to take a look at her. Trained negotiators arrived and they continued to speak with the suspect for over three and a half hours in an effort to convince him to peacefully surrender. During this time, the suspect could be seen moving around the house with a firearm in his hand, often with it held to his own head. <clears throat> After several hours, it became evident that the suspect was not going to leave the residence voluntarily. At that time, Mason County Sheriff's Office SWAT team introduced chemical agents to the residence. The suspect exited the residence with the gun in his hand, yelled at the officers before returning to the residence. Once again, he exited was right on the threshold of the house, the residence, and he put the gun to his head and shot himself in front of the officers that were there. SWAT officers, which includes a trained paramedic SWAT team member, immediately moved up to the residence, checked on the suspect, but determined <coughs> that he was beyond medical help. The officers then started a search of the main residence and approximately 11 outbuildings around that residence and property. Investigators at that point took over the scene at approximately 1240. Now what have we learned since then? Well, we put in countless hours to start with. Our people have worked very hard, very proud of all the work that they have done. And I want to remind you, this was a career criminal, a career criminal that murdered four people, victimized a fifth, and then shot himself. We learned that the children were possibly, one of the first things we had to deal with, we learned that the children were possibly adopted from a foreign country. On Saturday, we were contacted both by the Russian consulate and the Department of State trying to determine where the children were born and where they were adopted from. The Department of State was able to verify on Monday morning that the two victim boys were both adopted from Kazakhstan. As far as the subject or the suspect, he had an extensive criminal history, but none of the crimes were violent crimes that we could find. In Pennsylvania, he had multiple felonies related to property crimes such as theft, theft by deception, forgery, and the like. In Wyoming, property crimes, obtaining property by false pretenses, a felony. In Missouri, impersonating a police officer, grand larceny, felony false pretenses, etc. There was multiple pages of criminal history. We believe that the weapons used and the weapon that was in the suspect's hand that he shot himself with was a Walther PPK 380 caliber handgun. The weapon was registered to Terry Carlson, the late husband of Lana Carlson. This is a picture of a like weapon that was used, this is not a picture of the weapon because obviously it's still in evidence. And I will make this available to you later. Some questions have been brought up in reference to court orders. Campbell was served a Kitsap County District Court order and all attachments on July 17th of 2015. The Mason County Sheriff's Office sent and completed a return of service to Kitsap County District Court. The Kitsap County Court order contained a notice of surrender of firearms directing the suspect to surrender any firearms that he had to law enforcement. The suspect submitted to the Kitsap County Courthouse a notice of non-surrender on July 27th declaring that he had no weapons to surrender. At no time was the Mason County Sheriff's Office required to contact or search the residence. Campbell had the court order, other than the service order, let me start that over, Campbell, to contact, we were not required to contact Campbell about the court order, other than to serve the court order from Kitsap County. The Mason County Sheriff's Office was never directed by the court to confiscate any firearms from the suspect, and I'll go into more detail on that later on. Again, let me emphasize, we've only are four days into a very long investigation, so there's a lot of stuff that 
we have inklings of, we have indications that this might be true, but we haven't had it confirmed from many sources. So we're not in a hurry to be wrong. So with that in mind, we're not going to jump into things that people like forensics examinations haven't confirmed yet. At this time, I'd like to open it up to question. What is the status of the 12 year old girl? The status of the 12 year old girl, she is being overseen by Child Protective Services. We have experts that are taking care of her, making sure that the placement is there and they're working with the family. Is she with family? I don't know. Child Protective Service is the one that has oversight of that. Can you elaborate a little more on when you said the return of service and when you were dealing with that Kitsap County order? Had, elaborate a little bit more on the process of how this normally works, what that means, what the Mason County Sheriff's role would be if they were directed to do something like this by another county. Absolutely. Great question. Uh, the duty of the Sheriff's Office for a service of an anti-harassment order, which this was, with an order to surrender weapons issued without notice, attached, okay, the first thing that we do is we serve the order and any attachments that are attached to it by the court, as directed by the court. Then we, after we've served it, and oftentimes our community service officer is the one that's serving it, who is a non-armed, non-fully commissioned officer who serves the paper. We give a return of service to the court saying that we did serve that paperwork. If at the time of the service, when it has a order to surrender weapons, the person indicates that they do have weapons, at that point we will bring an officer and retrieve those or recover those weapons. If, or it is the responsibility of the person that has been served to submit to the court, the court of origin, within five days, either proof of surrender of these weapons with a receipt from law enforcement or a notice of declaration of non-surrender. Again, Mr. Campbell was served the Kitsap County District Court order and all attachments on July 17th by one of our deputies. Mason County sent back a complete, completed return of service to Kitsap County District Court. Mr. Campbell submitted a notice of non-surrender on July 27th to the Kitsap County, and on that non-surrender it says, I have surrendered any firearms other than dangerous weapons, or other dangerous weapons, or comp concealed pistol license pursuant to the order because I do not have any of those items. So he signed a document and sent it back to Kitsap County saying that he did not have any dangerous weapons, any firearms, or any concealed weapons. Now that you have a chance to talk to the 12 year old, has she given you any indication I understand you're going to have a lot of questions about the victim and in consideration of the community and the family members the and the process of forensic analysis the things that people have to do in the investigation uh, we will be sharing newly learned information about her with the family first the one thing I can say about that question, Keith, is that we have experts in forensic interviews with children that have been involved in traumatic events. And those experts are going to initiate an interview when they feel that she is ready to do that. Whether or not she has information that will be important to the case, we don't know yet. So you don't. It's not that you're not sharing a motive, it's that you don't have a motive yet. No, we do not have a motive yet, and we have not the experts have not conducted the forensic interview on the victim yet. Any indication as to why she was spared? No, not at this time. There's speculation, but we, we don't have any indication. We want to do that interview and collect all the information before we will venture out into saying why. Sure. Or, sorry. Uh, Chief, you said that she ran out of the house first. As the officers arrived. As the officers arrived. That was not uh, part of a negotiated release? No. I mean, is escape the right word to use there? That, that's how it's been described. We want to interview her before we really say what exactly occurred there. I can just say she came out onto the porch down the stairs and went to the officers on the far side of the house. Did the negotiators talk to the uh, subject about why he did it? Uh, that was, some of that was brought up, yes, as far as 
back and forth. I did talk to the officer because, again, this individual called one of our supervisors. The reason that he had called him is because he had had contact with him when he reported a theft on, let me go back to my notes. I apologize. July 20th. On July 20th, our supervisor had contacted the killer and he was reporting a theft for his family business. And that's why he had the card of our supervisor and that's who he decided to call. That individual was the one who talked to him almost all the way through until another negotiator was able to take over. Was there a conversation about who, why he was why he had just killed several people, uh, family members, and so forth? Some of that still has yet to be brought out as to exactly what was said. We're in the process of doing the interview and <laughs> dealing with a lot of other things, but we will put that out as soon as we do know it. At this point, again, from what I got just by listening to the uh, supervisor give a brief, is that the individual was very repetitive and saying, this is what I want, this is what I want, and didn't get into tremendous conversation as to why, what the motives were, or anything like that, but we have to still continue the investigation to see what we can find out, and then put it together with the interview, if we ever do get an interview, with the victim. With the autopsy, do you have now an estimated time of death where the individuals can be shot as he stated he did? Were they killed in the chicken coop, or were they around? There's still more tests to be done. They have to actually analyze the lead and match it with the weapon to see if that, in fact, is bullets from that weapon. It appears at this point that it was an execution style in the chicken coop. Any time of day that this happened? I, I don't know if they nailed it down to an exact time on the autopsy. They had five people to go through and they started just yesterday morning, so or the Monday morning. They still have three more to go on the autopsy and the forensic analysis. How did the elderly neighbor fit into this? Good question. We don't necessarily know. We know that she was a friend of the family. We, her vehicle was parked in the driveway, uh, almost at an angle like she just pulled in, but we don't know at this point. Other than that, unless we get information from the victim, we don't know. She Back to the discussion with the negotiator, the supervisor, you said you're yes. going around and around. The, the, the tone of him, what has it been described, was he apologetic, was he angry, was he was suicidal? I mean, can you let us in on any of, of what what was being said? What, what does that supervisor, how does he describe that three plus hours of the back and forth? He actually did, when I, when I got the brief from him, I didn't get the tone of what the individual was saying. I, I did get that he wasn't yelling or screaming. It was just a matter of fact. This is, this is what I want. This is where I'm going. This is what I want you to do. What did he want? He wanted to make sure, once we had the, the, the gal over there, he wanted to make sure that she was exited or got out of the area. The 12 year old? Yes. So while your folks felt trapped, Sound like he did not intend to hurt her. Don't know. That's that's he wanted her out of there. He was concerned about her safety. I don't know that. He wanted her out. There. He wanted her out. What does the law say about living in a home with somebody else's firearm when you're not allowed to have it yourself? Any convicted felon is not allowed to have possession of firearms. That's the law says that you cannot have possession of firearms. Even if they belong to somebody else and you're in the same house. Well, are you the? Depends on if you're the person in charge of that residence. You have constructive possession. So if these firearms were registered to the late husband and he dies, what happens to guns? Do they, would they go like a will to the, to the wife and she then own them? That, that's up to, the person, up to her. That would have been up to Lana. So that, she, we did have other firearms in the house, but we're still waiting for uh, a return from ATF because they've been very good on tracking the weapons. We did have some long guns, which would include a single shot shotgun, a 22, 12 gauge shotgun, a, another 22, and a bolt action uh, rifle. But there, at this point, there's no indication they were used in the crime, but we still have to wait to see how the tests come out. And, and back to the issue of him surrendering his weapons, as a 
Remember a law a court order, you mean? Yes. Yeah. It, it sounds like it's, it's, a, it's an honor system. Hand over your weapons, I don't have any. Right. He has to file a piece of paperwork saying, I don't have any, and he did. Right, and that's a, that's a lie. Uh, but as a member of law enforcement, is that frustrating to know that somebody, for whatever reason, may be thought to be dangerous enough to have to surrender his weapons? And Absolutely, it's frustrating. But we can only do so much. There, we, we need to comply. That was an order of protection, an anti-harassment order, which has, has yes. The order in question was a, an anti-harassment order, an order of protection. It's different than a no-contact order in which, for example, a case of domestic violence may be involved where the courts compel us to go in and seize weapons with the proper documentation. This being a lower tier order of protection, it is a voluntary and an honor system. And, and so when you say we, we had no point at that time based on the issuance of those orders to believe he was a danger. It was a dispute between two neighbors over an issue. So that's, yeah, it, it, it is a subtle difference in the law, but we can only follow what the law mandates. Would you like to see that us. Change, sure. I don't have an opinion on that. I enforce the laws. But uh, on orders of protection, uh, that's why we have counsel, that's why I have lawyers, that's why I have the legislators, and those are the folks who will make those decisions. But an anti-harassment order, many times it's just a, an honest dispute between neighbors that doesn't rise to the level um, of confiscating property or weapons, whereas no contact orders where we actually have acts of violence or criminal acts, that there's a proper purpose. Now, it does the fact that he, his criminal history had to do more with white collar crimes versus anything of a, a dangerous nature? Crimes of deception, crimes of dishonesty, crimes of theft. <coughs> yes, we, we, we were unable to determine any crimes of violence. But if he had a no, you know, no weapon order, that would have given you, would that have given you more uh, power to go on? That power? perhaps would have given the courts more authority to have us act on their behalf, but not for us. I'm not sure if it had been a DV no contact order, would that have given your sheriff's office enough to go in and possibly search for weapons in the home? If the order stated that that was the mandate, we would have. But it didn't? No. When, when, would, when did he, did he say he surrendered the uh, weapons or he said, I don't have any to surrender? Uh, the form that they have, it says, I understand that the court has ordered me to surrender any firearms, other dangerous weapons, or concealed pistol license that I own or have in my possession or control. I have not surrendered any firearms, other dangerous weapons, or concealed pistol license pursuant to that order because I do not have any of these items. And he signed that document. And that's seven, what date? That was on the... Uh, That was on July 27th, 2015. I'm, I'm looking at a protection order. order to not have those weapons legally. If they belong to her, would what he said is it possible that that's actually true? Is it possible that he doesn't have that? If this this order, you have to interpret it the same way I would. What does well, that I'm, mean I'm, when somebody gets that order? Is it in the, the residence? Law, I mean, under the law, if the weapons belong to Lana Carlson, could it? David Campbell go and say, well, I don't have any weapons. And legally, the distinction would be because they belong to Lana Carlson because she inherited them and whatnot. Is that a, a loophole or is, <coughs> is the fact that they're in the same house, it doesn't matter who legally owns them. He could get access to them even if they're his wife's. Well, access, ownership, are two different issues, and, and if they were in fact weapons belonging to Lana's deceased husband, uh, and the order compels him to turn over weapons in his name or what he has constructive possession of, then we would deal with those things if the court order allowed us to. But this protection order, an anti-harassment order, didn't allow us to do that. Uh, we would have had no knowledge once he completes that declaration we don't have any basis, a legal basis, to go in and pursue that. Uh, there is mechanisms following after that declaration that would take place legally um, in which the declaration would be filed, a failure to turn over or follow the court order may result in the prosecutor's filing 
uh, subsequently, uh, as a result of that, uh, surrender declaration. But to have an individual um, whose family members perhaps own a weapon is not necessarily going to compel him to acknowledge those weapons the way this order is. It appears he acknowledged owning at least two weapons in a protection order signed on the same day in Mason County. Right. We don't have, we don't have any record of that, sir. Are you familiar with that? I don't know where we, we would be more to whatever documentation we have, we'd be more than take Certainly. willing to take a look at that, sir. Okay. So but in other words, when we were saying that it seems that that statement you just read was a lie, it sounds like it might not be a lie because nothing compelled him to acknowledge that other people in the household might have weapons that were just not in his name. He's still in constructive right. possession in that residence. And it's our interpretation. He'd still be in constructive possession in that residence. So that was a lie. It's, it's deceptive no matter how you slice it. Can I ask on the international uh, uh, order again? S since you determined it was Kazakhstan, did that relieve the pressure from uh, all the Russian consulate folks? It folks? seems to have, yes. Uh, since we put out that it was confirmed from the Department of State that the two victim young men were adopted from Kazakhstan. We have not received the volume because we were receiving phone calls every 10 minutes from Russian reporters and we actually had the Russian consulate, two individuals, show up on our doorstep at the Sheriff's Office on Saturday. So this was obviously a big issue in Russia and other areas. And why was it a big issue? I, I can only speculate. I don't know. What did they tell you? Uh, they told me that it was very complicated. We, we asked them, why is this a big deal? And he said, it was, it's too complicated to really describe to you. So I'm sure there's lots of issues going on and people on different sides of the, of the argument as to whether or not to keep Russia open or closed for adoption. That's just my assumption. <coughs> no, not Kazakhstan. But you don't know any adoptions that have been affected? I do not. Because they've been stopped for a couple of years anyway. But the hope of reopening, I guess, I guess, would have been in jeopardy. And please, if you have any questions in this area, I did tweet out an email address from the Department of State, and they said direct any of questions that you have, reference inter-country adoptions, send it to them. And it's on our Twitter page. Do you guys know when the 12-year-old was adopted? Was it before or after? When? I do not have the exact date. Do you know when or uh, why Campbell moved to Washington? I do not know that. Secondly, on the adoption of it, all three children were adopted prior to Lana hooking up with Mr. Campbell, right? Yes, I, so he, with her former or her late husband. He assumed, did he adopt them himself, you know? I do not have paperwork to indicate that he adopted them. And she was also foreign born, correct? Right? Yes. And are you hearing from that government? No, I have not heard from that government. And it's not Kazakhstan. So just to clarify, all three children were adopted by Lana? prior to marrying Campbell? Yes. Other questions? Yeah, you mentioned that Kazakhstan officials did not contact uh, your department. Yes, they did. They did? Yes. And can you talk a little bit about it? They were just asking whether or not we had confirmed whether or not the children were adopted from Russia or Kazakhstan. Apparently, I think it was, they told me that in 2004, their records go from 2004 to present. But their records prior to that weren't so good on how many of the children that were adopted out of their country, so they wanted to have it confirmed. And where is it left off now? Is, are you Again, the State Department did confirm that the two victim young men were adopted from Kazakhstan. Now, this one, you don't have the time of death of when these folks were rounded up and placed in chicken. No, I do not have an exact time of death. We're still waiting until the autopsies are completed. Could it have been the night before some of the neighbors said they heard that fire tonight? It could be, but we have no information uh, forensically supporting that yet. So you have autopsies coming up? We have still three to do, it sounds like. And what else do you have to do for this investigation? Uh, we'll still continue with the investigation. We have multiple agencies uh, being involved. We have ATF still looking at the background on all of those long guns. The only information that they gave us back confirming was the 
handgun, the Walther PPK. We still don't know who the other ones were registered to, so we're following up on that. We still will end up with our forensic interviewers when and if they get an opportunity, depending upon their evaluation of our victim, they will get an interview from that. We still have the autopsies going. We still have evidence. We have toxicology reports from blood. There's lots and lots of things that are involved that we will get back and still be able to piece this together. Uh, because there is no suspect in this crime, the speed of the crime has been adjusted somewhat. Does that make sense to you? I hope you, you understand that. Uh, so that's a suspect or trial. Yeah, we have no suspect awaiting trial. So the speed of it at this point is a little bit different and we can focus more on protecting the victims and their families. The one thing we don't want to do is give out a bunch of information, for example, on this victim without the family having an opportunity to hear what we've learned first and our community to understand because we want to look out for their welfare and consider if it was your 12 year old. Would you want the media to know first the information or would you want to know it yourself? So that's one of the things and then with no suspect we're going to slow down some of these things. It'll all come out. All of it will. But we're just going to make sure that we have notified all the right people in sensitivity to what they're going through. Is there some immediate family for her eventually to go to then? I don't know that. That's Child Protective Service. I don't know what their procedures are, and we abdicate to them when it comes to something like this. That's who would be going back to China. I don't know that. That's completely up to uh, CPS and their laws, and I'm not familiar with those. Are you still having investigators at the scene? No, we do not have investigators at the scene. It was really only uh, uh, two rooms inside the residence and the chicken coop. And that was really all that we had to investigate and get the, the diagram so that we could come back and reproduce those rooms. That was really the only thing we had to do. So we've been done since the night of the crime. And again, all four were in the chicken coop. Yes, all four of the murdered victims were in the chicken coop, and it appeared that they had been executed. And Chief, while there's no suspect awaiting trial, you still want to answer? Absolutely. We still have a mandate to do our job and finish and follow through on all the investigations. It's just that without a suspect on trial, the urgency of getting information in so that they can be held on bail or one thing or another is adjusted so that we can consider the family and the victims. So we're slowing it down a little bit, making sure we have opportunities to talk to them first. I hope that makes sense. Are you getting anecdotal information on a possible motive, whether it's financial? We've had all kinds of anecdotal information, but it it's varies from one end of the spectrum to the other. Is it possible you mean never? Very possible. Very possible. It all depends on whether when the interview of the only live victim is done, whether she has recall or whether she's able to even express what happened or whether she even saw it. Sure, I'd like to add that, again, we you step this, up to the podium, please? Sure. we'd like to take this opportunity in order to try and narrow down that spectrum of information that anybody who might have information contact the East County Sheriff's Office Investigative Unit and, and share that, and that might help bring that down. Not having anybody left at the scene without any witnesses, it, it's a little bit difficult. So we, we would encourage anybody out there who might have some information to help narrow down what took place, please contact the office. Any other questions? Do you know if the, the handgun that he used on assault was the same one to the family? As I already answered that, is that we're waiting for the analysis from the people who do this investigation, the lead, they have to match the lead that's in the body to the lead that's to the gun, and it hasn't been confirmed yet. It's assumed that that was the gun that he used, but we have not confirmed that through forensic analysis. And how many guns did you guys have I think I already gave that out, but I'll give it again. Uh, we had the one handgun, and we had one, two, three, four, five long guns. ATF is still looking at the background and the registration on the long guns. They did confirm that the Walther PPK 380 caliber semi-automatic pistol, which holds, what is it, uh, holds seven bullets in the magazine and one in the chamber, was registered to Terry Carlson, the late husband of Lionel. How long ago did he die? I don't know that. One more question, please. Yeah, yeah, one, more. 
forensically interview the 12 year old. You just have information from her, but you haven't had the official sit down. Right. But, All right, sure. This is a final closeout. First of all, um, many of you that we have spoke with on the scene out here, I, I do want to thank many of you from the media that were very respectful in many ways to us. And it's difficult. I know that the answers, the questions that you want to ask sometimes are not questions that we have answers to yet, or may never have those. But I want to, in conclusion, bring us back to what I said in the beginning. This is a terrible tragedy for a family. We're asked constantly what we can do for this family. I just ask that you be respectful. Can you please keep the surviving little girl in your thoughts and your prayers as we move forward along with your family. Thank you for coming today.